Good evening. Welcome to this year's Candidates Forum that will help us learn more about the candidates running for the Greenville County School Board. I'm Beth Padgett. I'm editorial page editor of the Greenville News, and I'll serve as the moderator tonight. This forum is sponsored by the Public Education Partners, District 1 PTA, and the Greenville County League of Women Voters. We're just having one school board forum this year for candidates in the only two contested seats that will be on the ballot. They're in Districts 24 and 28. In the District 24 race, we have Jeff Dishner and Derek Lewis. In the District 28 race, we have Stephen Watterson and Lisa Wells. And we'll start uh, with Jeff Dishner, Area 24, with the first question is, what do you consider the most important issue facing Greenville County Schools over the next few years, and how will you address these priorities that you believe you see? Sure. Uh, just to begin, again, my name is Jeff Dishner. I appreciate Public Education Partners, League of Women Voters, and the South Carolina PTA for putting this on. It gives us a great opportunity as candidates to, to talk a lot, you know, how candidates like to talk. Um, uh, answer the question, I think growth is going to be one of the biggest issues that we're facing in the next five to ten years. From what I understand, the Greenville Chamber states that there are 13 families a week moving into Greenville County, so obviously those families include kids. So I look at that as being the single biggest challenge. And obviously there's a lot of things that go with that, from hiring good teachers to facilities, physical facilities, to finding new places to put schools. Uh, you know, I feel like I'm uniquely qualified. I'm a licensed architect. I've been in business for 25 years in Greenville County. Uh, I grew up here. Uh, I understand uh, the needs of the parents and students. And so I think uh, that we can really do that in a, uh, in, a, in a good, smart growth kind of fashion. Thank you, Derek Lewis. What do you consider the most important issue facing Greenville County Schools? How will you address this priority? Sure, I, so I'm the director of Greenville's First Steps office, and one of the work that, that we primarily do is working with um, our elementary schools and our high schools to build relationships so that families can transition in. And one of the things that we're learning is that teacher retention is really going to be a, a huge concern for our district in the next four or five years. We've got a, an aging population of teachers, um, and we've got a growing number of teachers who are leaving the workforce within the first five years which is going to pose a real concern in the next five or six years because as those teachers age out, there, there are not uh, seasoned teachers to take their place. You know, to address that problem, I think we're going to focus on a couple of things. One, we've got to look at how we're recruiting teachers, and I think we've got to really focus on where we can find the best teachers, but also what are we doing to help prepare those teachers when they enter school so that they're not in school surprised and leaving. I think we need to build stronger relationships with our teacher colleges. And I, I'm really excited about what's happening at uh, Fisher Middle School, where Clemson is actually going to have faculty based in that school. But I think the other thing is we've, we've really got to look at what are the burdens that we're putting on teachers that have nothing to do with what's happening in the classroom. We've got teachers that are addressing issues like teen pregnancy or hunger issues, homelessness, or children showing up with, without shoes. And I think we've, we've really got to focus on letting teachers teach and building community partners that can actually step in and help relieve those burdens. So we should partner with a United Ministries or a Goodwill or a Little Steps or a mentoring program like Mentor Greenville to help those families with those outside needs they may have. Okay, thank you. Stephen Watterson, same question, priority, uh, number one issue, and how you'll address it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to echo what Jeff said about thanking the people that, that put this on. It's sad that uh, we don't have a large number of folks that come out that uh, actually affects one of the most important aspects of our community, which is education. I tell people we only have our children from basically fifth or age five up to age 18, and then we put them out into the workforce. The main reason I chose to run in, uh, in Greenville County is I actually live in Greenville County, but I work in Columbia, and I actually work for the State Department of Education. So. I find myself between, as some people say, a rock and a hard spot because I, I'm privy to some things that, that these candidates are also privy to, but they would have to you know, put in a formal request to get it. Uh, I see Greenville County as at, at somewhat at a quagmire, and when I say that is because 65% of our jobs come from career technology, uh, yet we probably have one of the poorest career technology systems in the state in Greenville County. Uh, with that being said, I also look at the, the young kids like you take the first steps. If we don't grab these children at a young age, then we lose them. 
And one thing our superintendent made a comment about, uh, about uh, graduation and people quitting school, they do quit between the third and the fifth grade. They check out and they just hang around until it's time to move on. Uh, so I see where our growth is, is that we need to put much more emphasis on the unique child and not necessarily that everyone has to be a four-year grad. Uh, I can share many experiences with you when I was in the military. We took kids straight out of high school and within 40 weeks they're programming nuclear reactors. Now, of course, we probably don't want to do that in a civilian society. Okay, thank you, Mr. Waterson. Lisa Wells, same question. Thank you. Being on the school board for the last four years, I recognize that the biggest challenge is always going to be for the school district how we raise the bar of student success with limited resources. So we have to continue to look at new technology, new ways of teaching, uh, how students are learning, and then also figure out how we can get our legislators to recognize funding required to make our students successful. So I think we'll continue, need to continue to focus on raising student success uh, and working on stable funding. Okay. Thank you. If you'll pass the microphone back. We'll start with Derek Lewis for this next round of questions. Derek, how should schools prepare students for jobs that do not exist today? How should schools go about preparing students for jobs that we can't even imagine what they are sitting here tonight? You know, I've had the privilege the last couple of years to serve on the Chamber's Education Council. And, and that's a question that the Chamber's been wrestling with for a long while. And, and they, they just completed a Sears study that actually said that one of the, the greatest needs is we need to, to raise a group of students who are critical thinkers. We're, we're good at teaching students a specific skill that when they leave high school they're able to, to conduct. But we're not able to get them to interviews on time. We're not able to get them to uh, show up professionally for an interview. We're not able to get them to think about what happens when they don't know the answer to a problem. So I, I think that's going to be a, a real challenge. But, but in addition to that, I'm, I'm really concerned about um, us teaching our students how to use technology that, that doesn't exist. Um, I'm, I'm excited about the project-based learning. I'm particularly excited about the new tech work that's happening at two of our schools right now. And, and I think that's going to kind of bring us a long way. But, but I think that in addition to having access to technology, we, we have to have teachers that need to need that ongoing professional development. I mean, if, you, if you're a teacher and you're teaching and you are older than I am, um, then you didn't have an email address when you were in college. Um, and so an expectation that those, that those teachers could teach students how to use technology that didn't exist when they were being trained how to teach, um, I, think, I think is something that we need to address. So I think preparing our teachers with continued professional development around technology will allow them to help the students better embrace new technologies that may not exist when they're in school. Thank you. Uh, Stephen Watterson, same question. How should schools prepare students for jobs that don't even exist today? Uh, it's amazing that uh, the jobs that have come about in the last few years that didn't even have a name. One of them is uh, cybersecurity. A couple of years ago, we didn't even know what that is. And, and now we see the IT uh, uh, people, such as University of South Carolina, Clemson, uh, College of Charleston, all embracing cybersecurity. Uh, I don't know if you've been affected by it, but it's amazing some of the things that we do around this state when we have Cyber Saturday uh, down, in, uh, down in Columbia, the ITology building, and come to see the 7th and 8th graders that show up that can hack into a system faster than we can find an ON button. Uh, so those jobs are new and they're evolving. One aspect that got me about uh, when I came back to the United States is uh, having lived uh, abroad for many years, I was seeing how they embraced their new educational norms. Uh, like the New Tech High Schools that uh, we've implemented here in the county, Carolina, and James L. Mann. That's to broaden those students' opportunity because they're going to be exposed to things that they would not be exposed of in the standard lecture classroom. So we, we're going to see this because, as they say, when you're in college, when you're in your third year, you've already what you've learned is already obsolete by the time you graduate, which is pretty much the case. Uh, so technology has to be the forefront. Uh, and when I say technology, I'm just not talking about the iPads and the PCs and things such as that, but also the critical thinking skills that comes along with that, which means the student has to do something without very little information. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Well, I, I think the thing we are doing and we've been working toward for the last several years is working on 21st century skills. And those are the skills of communication, collaboration, being able to adapt to things, we are in the process of moving our kids into being the lifelong learners that they're going to need to be 
to move into their adulthood. Uh, you know, we're seeing that where we're, we're needing to change careers and change jobs and reinvent ourselves. And so we're working toward the 21st century skills. We're exposing them to a, a balanced amount of STEM and arts, all those things, instead of trying to focus and hone in and saying we're going to expose them to just technology, I would say it's really important for us to keep them wide open and to be sure that we're giving them enough opportunity in the arts and exposing them to the STEM, the science and the math and the technology with that. Project-based learning is a great vehicle for that because they're going to learn how to work with other people and they're going to learn how to be part of a team and know what it feels like to not have someone share your idea and, and to fail and then need to go back and do something over or, or think of a different way to do something. Our classrooms are moving toward being teacher-directed and student-led. I think that is going to be the thing that's going to help our students because we're asking students now and we're going to continue to make that classroom one where the students are asked to lead their learning. You let us know how you're going to approach this and how you're going to master this content. We're going to expose them to entrepreneurship and then they will create these jobs. Okay, great. Thank you. I'll pass the microphone back and Jeff, a question to you. In, uh, in my business, I deal with a lot of manufacturing clients. I sit at the table with them, and they're looking at relocating to Greenville or looking to come into this area. Um, and I deal with uh, technology uh, manufacturing uh, companies. So specifically, I deal with um, carbon fiber manufacturing, which is one of the new technologies that's coming down the way. And so when we talk about kids learning uh, about new technology, I look at it kind of in a different way than learning about computer repair or you know different types of iPads and uh, the, the new technology which is coming out on a commercial level. I look at it as partnering with manufacturers to be able to teach the kids what kind of jobs or what are the skills that the jobs they are going to have when they get out with this new kind with these new kinds of technology. Carbon fiber is one example, but I think. Uh, you know, every kid is not going to go the traditional uh, four-year college route. Uh, but I think as a, as a school system, we definitely need to be getting our kids ready for any kind of future that they desire. And having more emphasis on vocational education in our school system is definitely important. I, my perception is that it's dwindled over the last several uh, couple of decades, and I'd like to see more emphasis on that. Thank you. We'll start with uh, Stephen Watterson for this third round. Uh, the question, Stephen, our school district has a general fund budget that's about $500 million. What experience do you have dealing with complex budgets? And if you're on the school board, how will you go about balancing competing needs for those limited dollars? Uh, most of my budget uh, uh, infrastructure, so to speak, was in the military, and I, and I controlled budgets as well up, well up to $500 million uh, on certain projects that we did throughout the world. Uh, when I retired, I think my budget in the county school district was $3,500, and I had to had to stretch that for the whole school year. And I and I taught a program called Project Lead the Way, and just some of the tooling was quite expensive because I run a CNC and a robotics and digital electronics and so forth. Uh, then when I went to Greenville Tech, when I was over there, my I really had a budget person that was in, in charge of the budget, but I still had to be mindful of what I purchased for the classrooms and things such as that. My job at the State Department, I'm one of five program managers that oversees roughly $20 million and most of that money goes to what is called Perkins and it goes to your career in technology. And uh, when it comes to the school districts, the school districts have a certain amount of money that they can request and of course we approve if, if they get it or so forth. And then we have to come and check see if they did what they said they were going to do with it. Uh, one thing at least made a comment about, uh, about the sustainability as far as the budget goes. Uh, when you look around the state, and I brought some information here, roughly Greenville County uh, spent, it was a little over, uh, almost $8,000 per student. Then you go to Clarendon 1, and if anybody knows where Clarendon 1 is, uh, they spend $13,000 per student. And then you question, well, where do they get that money from? And I understand how we weigh it uh, between the State Department. So. I would have to look at the budget and see where we could go from there. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Same question. Ask that question again. Uh, the school district has a general fund budget of about $500 million. What experience do you have in, uh, in uh, dealing with complex budgets, and how would you go about, or how do you go about balancing competing needs for those limited dollars? Uh, well, I'll say I 
had some experience before I came to the school board working uh, in project management as an engineer, uh, but it was nothing compared to what we had to deal with at, at the school district. Uh, you know, you have all your different sources of funding and some of them you get dollar for dollar, some of them you get 72 cents on the dollars. A lot of them have strings attached. Uh, and we have a great finance department with the district that helps us manage that and understand uh, the, the, all those strings that are attached. I think the most important role we play is being sure that in, within that budget, we are looking at what's meaningful in terms of the programs and how effective they are. You know, our, our role is to be sure that every program that's run and every resource that we're expending is effective in what it's doing. And so we do that by looking for analysis on, you know, show us the data on if this is working and if it isn't. If it's not working, we don't need to do it anymore. So I think that's the key in, as a school board member, how we balance that budget because we have to depend on, uh, you know, that finance director to give us the book that's this thick that shows us all the line on data. And then we pull apart the pieces that we know they're important um, based on the programs that we've invested in that, for that year. Okay, if you'll pass the microphone back to Jeff. Same question. Big budget, your experiences sure, dealing sure. with big budgets. Uh, I deal with budgets every day. Uh, I'm an architect, I'm a project manager with Floor Corporation. Some of the projects that we deal with are up to half a billion dollars a year that we spend uh, on some complex issues. Uh, as a project manager, I look at uh, where the money's going, who it's going to, uh, how effectively it's being spent, uh, how you evaluate the, the time, the money, cash flow analysis, pro forma. Uh, so with 25 years of business, this is kind of nothing new for me. So I feel like I, I, I would be a good candidate for the school board, uh, primarily because I have a, the, the level of experience with looking at complex budgets. Okay, Derek? Yeah, I'm, I'm fortunate that as the executive director of Greenville's First Steps Office, our budgets actually mirror the, the school district's budgets. And so um, when we look at EFA dollars, or EIA dollars, or Medicaid dollars, or local private dollars, or local tax dollars, we, we have the similar, similar structure between First Steps and, and, the, and the school district. And, and, I, and that, that does make it complicated because the strings that are tied to a Medicaid dollar are very different than the dollars that you can leverage through a millage rate increase. Um, and so I, I understand how all of those play together. What I would recommend is that the, that the district um, look at our public and private dollars. What I would propose is actually we, we create an office of innovation and collaboration. And that, that office, that we take $50,000 out of our local military dollars, which is one-tenth of one-tenth of one percent of our school district's budget. And then we go to Criminal and Giving, the Community Foundation, the United Way, and to the Hollingsworth Fund, and we asked them to also put in $50,000 each, which is similar to the approach that the school district's already taken with the White Horse Road Corridor project. Then what I would do is use those dollars to create a department that would actually look at all of our funds, not only the funds that the district manages, but the PTA funds and the, the local private funds that are raised at the schools to figure out how we can identify what are the expenses that schools are incurring and whether we're using them and spending them in the right place or not. It doesn't make any sense to me that we have PTAs that are raising money to pay for a copy machine. It doesn't make sense to me that we have school teachers that have to buy co copies of paper and bring them to their schools. So, so I think we would probably want to look at all of those dollars and carefully make sure that we're spending them in the right place. Okay. Thank you. And we'll start with uh, Lisa Wells. Before we do, if you have any questions, have you written them down? Hold your uh, green sheets up and a volunteer will come take them. And while they're doing that, I'll ask uh, a round that starts with Lisa. In what cases, if there are any instances, would it be appropriate for the school board to raise taxes? In what cases, in what instances, is it appropriate for the school board to raise taxes? Well, this is an issue we've dealt with every year that I've been on the board. Uh, and every year, what is brought to us is, uh, you know, all the mandates that have come down from the state, what the costs are that incurred, that have been incurred with that. Um, they show us where we need to make changes to help, for instance, make sure we have sufficient number of bus drivers. Uh, this past year we actually had to include a pay increase for bus drivers because we cannot keep bus drivers uh, on staff. And if you can't get your kids to school on time in a safe manner, then it doesn't do any good what you have at school. So, you know, what, what the other thing they do for us then is we look at all those, what the, those things are, and then 
they tell us what we think we're going to get from the state. And I have to say, uh, since 1975, when the Education Finance Act was put into place, the Budget Control Board established what that number should be. And in 39 years, the state has fully funded that base student cost, 11 of those 39 years. So unfortunately, there have been, every year, we've had to deal with those millage increases because what we're required to spend um, by the state and for local requirements isn't being met by the state. Okay, great. If you'll pass it back up to Jeff, please. Same question, in what cases would it be appropriate to raise taxes, if there are any? Sure, sure. I kind of agree with uh, Lisa, and I, I will commend that the current school board has done a very thoughtful introspection every time they've actually had to increase uh, taxes via their village rate increase uh, uh, ability. When, when they receive these unfunded mandates from the state, it, uh, with a, there's a lot of discussion, obviously it's a very hot topic, but so I think what happens is that they only increase it just enough to cover the unfunded mandates. There's no gravy, there's no, uh, they look for other avenues to uh, fund new programs or uh, reallocate funds within their existing budgets. So I, I think they do a really good job. Uh, if, you know, if I'm more elected to school board, I would do the same kind of thoughtful introspection. Uh, I don't want to increase taxes uh, unnecessarily, but I think you have to when you have these unfunded mandates from the state. Derek? You had the opportunity of serving on the Joint Citizen Legislative Committee on Children as one of Governor Haley's appointees. And one of the things that we receive through that committee are recommendations that come up through the, not only the state school board association, but come up through local school boards. And we, we talk a lot about unfunded mandates, but I think, I think in this district and, and across the state, what we really have missed the opportunity for is to educate our elected officials about legislation before those bills become law. I think we could have dealt with some of the read to succeed unfunded mandates um, really early on when that legislation was being written if we had been a little bit more proactive in making sure that our delegation not only understood where we were coming from, but also understood what we were already doing. I think in the, in the case of the read to succeed bill, we're talking about you know, reading interventions. We already have those in the schools. Um, and so I, I think there's, there's a real need for us to make sure that we're proactive with our delegation. You know, I'm fortunate that, that I've been endorsed by eight of our delegation members, including uh, Senator Turner and Representative Bannister, who would really play a key role in helping to shape that legislation. I think currently we are increasing our millage rate basically to cover cost of living increases for teachers. And so there is no end to those increases until we really start getting proactive with our legislative delegation about what we're requiring of our, of our schools and what we can really fund within the current system. Thank you. Stephen Watterson, same question. Well, as they say, taxes are a necessary evil, and, uh, and I'm mindful that uh, to have a good educational system, you do have to have taxes that will support that. And I am very grateful that the school board up to this point has, has been very mindful about how our taxes have been put into play for the, for the school district. Uh, it is a sad fact that we do have a lot of un, unfunded mandates, uh, and, and the state has not come or stepped up to the plate to cover those. And it's not only in the academic aspects, uh, you talk teachers, uh, where they have teachers $250 each in the state, they allow that money to still go, but then they allow the districts to flex it. So sometimes those teachers don't get that $250, depending on if the district wants to flex that money, which means the teacher does have to go pay for that uh, ream of paper because he or she doesn't have that, that supply to go into the classroom. And uh, uh, when it does come to taxes, I've been in Greenville County long enough to know that I've seen our taxes go down when it comes to the school, and now I'm seeing them go back up. Uh, but I also look at it this way. Uh, you get what you pay for. And sometimes not necessarily good. We can take Chicago School District, for example, which is the worst school district in the, in the nation. And it has one of the highest tax rates. and has one of the highest teacher salaries. Uh, Greenville County has done a wonderful job with the taxes that they have. And, and, and I do feel sorry that I come from an agency that doesn't fund us the way we should be. But that's when we have to educate not only our legislation, but our parents, our parents to get involved. Thank you. We will bring it, the microphone back down. We'll start the fifth round with Jeff Dishner. A question from the audience. Why is it important to have recess for students every day? Um, I is that think from a student? <laughs> recess all around. Um, 
You know, I think recess is a great thing to have every day, but one of my uh, one of my platform issues, one of my big platform issues, is what I call the three A's: uh, rigorous academics, uh, greater emphasis on the arts, and more opportunities for athletics. And athletics, I mean not just uh, un, uh, unstructured play on a daily basis, but for instance, my son who's in the audience uh, gets one day of structured PE class a week. I think that's uh, terrible. Uh, I think we need to have more opportunities for that because, you know, I, I don't think a child really understands uh, and has the energy to be still in a classroom and to be able to be ready to learn unless he's exhausted some of that nervous energy. Um, you know, I'm uh, fortunate enough that I have the time that I can coach my son's soccer team at the YMCA or my daughters, I can pay to have them go swimming with Team Greenville. So I, I think that a lot of kids out there don't have those opportunities for structured uh, athletic involvement. Uh, I really do think that it's something that we need to reintegrate back in our schools. Derek, recess. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's always listed as a time issue, um, but I had the opportunity of visiting a, a teacher at Augusta Circle who, um, in the middle of teaching science, actually took the kids out as part of her science class and got them out onto the, onto the playground and, and really got them kind of looking at trees and plants and, and moving around. And, and so I think you know, some of our creative teachers are finding ways to get kids to move around in the middle of, in the, middle of the day, which I think is, is really important. I think though that one of the other things we can look to is where do we have community partners that can come into our schools to help facilitate that kind of work. So you take an organization like the YMCA, which has already kind of spearheaded the Live Well campaign and has got our schools thinking about healthy and nutritious meals and how to, how to be active. The groups are also sponsoring activities like booster thons instead of selling wrapping paper so that the kids are moving around as some sort of structured activity as a fundraiser. And the, and the YMCA and, and there are other organizations like them are ready and willing to come into the schools to partner with teachers, partner with principals to provide that kind of structured activity at no additional cost to our schools. And I think that's really what we're going to have to look for. We're, we're going to have to find some real creative ways to bring community partners who are experts in this work to allow our teachers to kind of take that time to focus on the things they need to focus on. Stephen Watterson. Okay, recess. I'd like to say away on what Lisa talked about on 21st century skills. Recess is a perfect opportunity to practice that. You have teamwork, you have collaboration. Uh, you know, the, the students have to get along with one another out there on the recess field. I know when my older children were going through school, they had recess all the way up through well, when they graduated their 12th grade, and that was down in Berkeley County. Uh, they did attend Greenwood County Schools for a short time. We were in between duty stations. We'd come back home, so to speak. Uh, one thing I've noticed throughout the world, when I lived in Germany, when I lived in Japan, Italy, all those school systems have PE uh, from the time they're in school until the time they graduate. And you, you ask yourself, how do they do that? Uh, well, they put it into their work day or into their instructional day. I know when I taught at O'County, I had a two, two hour and 40 minute block. In other words, I had to teach for two hours and 40 minutes uh, from podium to podium or bell to bell. Well, about halfway through, you can see those, those teenagers start getting lethargic, especially when even though they're doing hands on, they're doing CAD and they're, they're on computers and they're building things. About halfway through, they're a little bit tired of being inside that room. So uh, I came up with innovative things. I brought in a robotics. Uh, uh, platform and they actually used that. Uh, now, was that a recess? Well, yes, it was. They took a break from their from their uh, academics and did that part of it. I would love to see it happen. How we're going to do that? Uh, that's, that's something to be seen. Lisa, well, I think brain research will show you that, that you're going to get better performance uh, and focus when there's physical activity. And the Legacy Charter School is a good example of a, a school that's committed to using that focus to see if they can get you know, higher achievement ratings. So I do think we need to allow time for activity, but I think that free time, when you talk about recess, it really does need to be a time for kids to be able to explore. We shouldn't just send them out on the playground and say, okay, now you're gonna go for 20 minutes and do. I think having some ways for them to explore the things they want to explore during that time. So if they really are a physically active, energetic kid, they might go, screaming to the playground or running out and playing football like one of my sons did and if they're not so much like my other son then they might choose to play with some Legos or take their book and read their books. So I think the idea that we have recess for kids is going to look different for every, every, every kid and I think we do have those um, structured into the day. I think we don't recognize them 
a lot of the things we talk about when you talk about career in tech ed and you say, well, we're not sending enough kids to the career in tech ed center, it's because it doesn't look the way it did 20 years ago. You have those things infused inside of our high schools and inside of our, our different programs. And I think recess is much the same. When you walk into a kindergarten class and you see kids jumping up and down and saying their ABCs or they're doing side words, <coughs> they're engaging in a recess activity that's going to help their brain, but they don't realize it's recess. Okay, they just know that it's fun and they're learning at the same time. Thank you, Wilson. The mic to Derek. Derek, this next question from the audience. There was a mention of teachers spending time addressing the individual students' needs, things such as homelessness, personal issues they may have uh, with parents. What do you see as the role of our school counselors in our schools, and are we adequately staffed in that area? So several years ago, the district had a teen parent program, and the, the program was literally an alternative school where teenage moms were sent uh, when they were pregnant. They stayed there until their baby was six weeks old, and they were sent back to their schools. What we found from first steps was that most of the moms didn't return back to their schools because of child care issues. Uh, as the building started to crumble, the district decided to close the program, and they sent the girls back to their high schools. When I joined the SIC at Greenville High, we had biology teachers that were literally teaching 10th grade girls how to nurse their babies. Um, and, and, and that's just not, not an appropriate role for teachers. So we brought together the guidance counselors, the social workers, um, both at the district level and in the school level, and we said, you know, let's make a list of the things that these girls need as supports, and then let's, let's identify who are community partners that can help those, those students. And we identified child care, we identified you know, health needs, we identified safe sleep um, and medical needs. We identified that most of these girls don't have a consistent medical home. And so we, we paired these girls um, through a refer referral service with Nurse Family Partnership, which is a research-based program that we brought to Greenville County um, that does home visits for nurses with moms. We paired them with, um, with Little Steps and then we paired them with child care vouchers. And the graduation rate for teen moms in the last four years has gone from 50% to 88%. Um, the way that works is by providing more resources for these completely overwhelmed teachers and social workers so they have more referrals to make out into the community. Okay, thank you. Same question, Stephen? Well, having been a former classroom teacher, I, I, can, I can tell you that uh, at times I was a mom, a dad, a doctor, uh, a pastor, uh, a little bit of everything, and I did not have the credentials to do that. And where I was, we had what was a, a career counselor, which means that that counselor was more attuned to getting that person uh, ready for a career, not necessarily about having homelessness or not being able to have anything to eat before he came to school that day or going home to a place that had no electricity. Uh, the state has, has worked hard to get counselors and fund counselors into the school system, but I think we're somewhat overwhelmed in that area. Uh, even though the, we put money into having a global career facilitator to take some of that burden away from the career counselors where the career counselors could do the, uh, what they were trained to do, but that is not always the case in all school districts and it's not the case in Greenville County because it's been as large as it is. And we do have to look for resources like First Steps, the YMCA, uh, Safe Haven, and those institutions to come in and help us in those areas. Uh, because we can't do it by ourselves. Uh, you go to some of these uh, uh, schools and the career counselor is one and she's got a student population of 11, 1200, even though we know it's not supposed to be that kind of a ratio, but that's the way the funding goes. So we do need to reach out to our partners, such as uh, I mentioned earlier, Safe Haven and those type of folks to get into our schools. Thank you, Lisa. The question was about the uh, teachers spend a lot of time addressing the students' needs, homelessness, trouble at home, that sort of thing. Uh, what's the role of school counselors, and are we adequately staffed there? Um, no, we're not adequately staffed, and we're working on that. Um, I'm proud to say that last year uh, our school board approved a uh, board initiative increase in funding for our guidance and our guidance counselors and counseling services to try to ensure that, that students do have help. We were able to increase funding to reduce the ratio of the number of students to a counselor, and we also made sure that we a counselor was available every day that a child was in school, because we had situations where there were schools where a counselor was there three days a week, 
Well, what, ha what if the child has a bad day on the day that the counselor's not there? Do we tell them, I'm sorry, you have a problem today. You'll have to come back tomorrow when the counselor's here. So um, our school board has been, was proactive and supportive of saying this is an issue that we need to address. Um, we are going to help our guidance counselors. Our guidance counselors at the high school level, once again, we have, a, we have mandates for individual graduation plans and all this training that they're required to do that takes their focus away from providing those very necessary helps, whether it's dealing with homelessness or whether it's just dealing with the child who thinks they've, they've been, who feels like they've been bullied or who can't function in the classroom. Our counselors can help with those things if we are able to bring those numbers down, bring those ratios down, and give them the, the uh, ratios they need to help those students. So I'm proud to say that that is something that we've worked on and will continue to work on. Thank you, Jeff. Send the microphone back. Same question to you. Uh, I have a tendency to agree with Lisa. I think we are probably understaffed uh, with our counselors. Um, when I was chair of SIC at Sterling School, Charlestown Center, uh, we really made an effort to engage the school within the community because if you remember, that was where the old Beck Middle School, formerly the Beck High School was, and that school was a really integral part of the, of the uh, Nickel Town community. So we tried to really engage uh, a lot of the families who are in the immediate capture area around that school to come in and read to their children. They may not have had a, a, a mentor type a person in their life that read to them growing up. They, we also had classes at night to help uh, folks learn how to use a personal computer. Basic things that a lot of us take for granted that weren't there. So, uh, the, the, and our guidance counselors there were, were very big parts of that. So I think that, uh, and also the guidance counselors um, really pushing the, the problems in the direction of, of a lot of the local agencies is kind of the direction that I would like to see. But I do think that we need we do need more guidance counselors in schools, and especially in the schools in the area like that, like the Sterling School, where we had a lot of uh, uh, socioeconomic disparity. Thank you. We'll go to Stephen Watterson. Start this round seven. Take a minute and tell us about your volunteer and service contributions to Greenville County Public Schools that's outside of any paid employment. What sort of volunteer and service contributions have you made to our public schools? Uh, well, when I first came over to Greenville Tech, I was, I was on the, the board for the Greenville High School for their project lead the way. I was the post-secondary representative. <laughs> Uh, then that young man took a job at the uh, Inland Port Authority, so that, that program somewhat went down. Uh, my two younger children, they attended the charter school system, so I actually served on that school board uh, back in 2010-2011, and also was involved in their fundraisers because uh, as a charter school, there's some monies they don't get, and they have un, un, uh, unmandated or unfunded mandates as well, and so that's what we did there. Uh, I've always volunteered with the U.S. First Robotics teams that are involved in high school and also over at, uh, well, the Greenville Tech team, the Greenville Tech team has been taken on from, from Wade Hampton and various other places. I've always been a judge for U.S. First Robotics, but it's held in Myrtle Beach now. It was going around the state. It started out at USC, then went to Clemson, and I think it's probably found a home in Myrtle Beach now. Uh, but I, I constantly go to the schools and talk about the U.S. First Robotics and the STEM initiative and the Project Lead Way. And I have offered my services to the former uh, career, uh, excuse me, the Cape Director for Greenville County, but he's no longer in that position. There's a new one there now by the name of Brooke Smith. And he and I will be talking next week about uh, doing some continued volunteering for the FIRST Robotics and some other stuff. So that's what I've been doing since I've been in Greenville County. Thank you. Same question. Lisa, a little bit about your volunteer contributions to the public schools here. Uh, well, I guess my, my volunteer contributions are how I came to be so passionate about Greenville County Schools and Education. Uh, I was comparing notes with uh, someone before the meeting, and I'm in my 12th year of being actively involved in PTAs and SICs, and I've been in every position you can imagine. Started out with SICs because I was really interested in that curriculum part of it, that piece, and then pulled into PTA and did those things you don't like to do, like fundraising. So I, I cut my teeth on that, and I'm still actively involved there. Uh, band boosters, I've been involved with them, and athletic boosters uh, by way of my children. Uh, in addition, I've helped here at Malden High School with the Project Lead the Way program, serving as a mentor to uh, particularly female students who are interested in engineering and STEM fields. Uh, it's a delight to be able to come and spend time with those ladies. 
I'm involved with the 10 at the top task force uh, for human potential. It's a group that was created. Uh, we've been meeting probably three years now to talk about the issues around the human potential in the community and how education affects uh, both our, our young students but our families and then the workforce development piece. And I'm on the Rubber Mountain Science Center Association Board, have been involved with that as a volunteer uh, and the board liaison, helping those folks with everything from fundraising to strategic planning, um, Green Halloween, you name it, and we, we've done it at Rubber Mountain. And then most recently, there's a Southern Greenville Citizens Group uh, that started meeting that I've been participating in uh, in the southern part of the county. Thank you. Thank you. The microphone comes back to Jeff. Same question. Um, as I've said many times, I've got three children in our public school system, and uh, as any involved and overly involved parent would know, I've been in, you know, working in their school since they were in kindergarten, done everything from math superstars with my elementary age uh, children to uh, classroom uh, volunteering just to help a teacher out on occasionally, and then leadership positions within the schools through the SICs and, uh, and involvement with the PTA. Um, I've also been involved uh, kind of peripherally with schools through the YMCA Camp Greenville where we've partnered with schools, partnered with organizations say like the Pleasant Valley Connection uh, to get kids involved in nature learning. Uh, so we use part of the Open Doors funding with the YMCA to get the kids in this particular area up to Camp Greenville, spend a few couple of days learning about nature, learning about uh, native animals. Um, so, you know, really the eight years that I've spent in the public education system with my kids volunteering, that, that to me is a lot, okay? As a parent, I don't think you really understand, um, or as a person in our, in our community, really don't understand the way schools need to operate, uh, the needs of the, the students, the concerns of other parents, and then the, what teachers need uh, from the standpoint of support, unless you actually have kids in the public school system. So uh, I really do think that that's important. Derek? Yeah, I've, I've been really fortunate with my job at First Steps and with the YMC of Greenville to, to visit with all of our schools. And in fact, um, over, the, over the last year, we counted that, that I've actually been in over 50 of our schools meeting with principals, teachers, administrators, talking about what, what their needs are. I also have the privilege to serve not only on the School Improvement Council and the school my child will attend at Greenville High, but also at Bells Crossing School Improvement Council and at A.J. Wittenberg, which are three very different schools. Um, and I think to make the assumption that experiencing one school or two schools prepares you to understand what those other 98 or 99 schools in the district are like is, is, is a real mistake. I think that the other thing that we've really been involved with is, is being involved with the United Way and the Chambers and Education Committees because, you know, again, I, I think there's really very little that the school district can be expected to do beyond what they're already doing without some community partners. And I, I think there's, there's nothing more important than making sure that we have community partners at the table. And the work that we've done at the United Way, the work that we've done with the Chambers Education Council, really have helped us reach into Sterling, Nickeltown, Pleasant Valley in real strategic ways that can bring private resources to, to the school district. Thank you. We'll start with Lisa for this eighth round. According to uh, this question, uh, year-round schools have shown they help student academic success by eliminating what's called the summer slump. Do you feel Greenville could or should try a year-round schedule? Uh, yes, I do. We've, we've had discussions about um, that. We actually tried that model before and it was not successful in the past. Um, most recently what we've tried to do is address that summer slide by having special programs in targeted areas. And I think we've seen the, in the infancy of that, we're seeing that that's successful in allowing students an opportunity that need it to come into the classroom. Um, I'm not a proponent of doing away with all the wonderful summer activities that everyone loves so much with swim team and all those things, but I do think there's a place uh, for students because you can't catch up if you're going to school the same amount of time as the kid you're behind. So I think to have an opportunity where we have programs that are year-round for students that, that need to take advantage of that is something that we'll continue to look at and figure out how to, how to provide a resource in that way. Okay. I'll send it back to Jeff. Same question about whether we should have year-round schools. 
Uh, I agree. I agree. I mean, I, I, with my job, I travel the world. I look at all different uh, types of school systems. I deal with businesses, and they're really looking for uh, a better quality of student coming out of our schools. And I think if that's one we, that's one way we can do it. I think it's going to give uh, kids more of an opportunity to uh, continue their education throughout the summer months. Uh, I think uh, there are programs that we could do to, to keep that summer slide at bay, but in, in reality, I, I think that um, I think we're going to have to catch up with the rest of the world when it comes to education, and we, we need more time, whether that be a longer school day or a longer school year. I think my kids are probably frowning at me down there right now, but uh, I think this is going to allow us to give us a, a little bit more of a rigorous educational process. Derek? Yeah, there, there's no question that the summer slide is one of the biggest challenges that, that students face, particularly low-income families. And, and I, I really applaud public education partners for the work that they did with the district this summer, providing backpacks. And it was really exciting going to Hollis, which was one of the schools that, that tried doing year-round schools and, and, and turned back from it, to see these kids have the opportunity to, to choose books that they wanted to read and to take those books home. But, but what was really exceptional about that program in addition to the fact that it was one of the first times that kids got to pick their own books rather than just having somebody airdrop a backpack of books or a box of books to their home, was that the teachers followed up with those students and set the expectation that this is what we want you to do when you're not with us. Imagine if we could do that with our summer camp programs. Imagine if we had teachers creating relationships with the YMCA summer camps where over 700 kids receive summer camp services and visiting those 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 summer camp programs with the same sort of book distribution system so that in the middle of summer camp when all the counselors are already thinking of a million things they can do inside because it's 100 degrees outside why don't we create a literacy program where we've got traveling teachers that can can work with our schools so i think there are ways we can get around having to expand the school day which i'm not in favor of or going to year-round schools which we've, we've tried and, and really struggled with and just find ways to better engage places where students already are in continued learning that would prevent that summer slide. Stephen Waters, the same question. Uh, when I travel around the state, that's one thing I hear from teachers uh, pretty much in every district I go to, is that when the, when the students return from summer break and even when they return from Christmas break, it's almost like they have to do two to three weeks of a, a remedial to get them back up to speed. Uh, living in Japan for, for eight years, my children attended a Japanese public school uh, in, in the Japanese language, and, uh, and as you know, the Japanese go year-round. Well, let's put year-round into perspective. Is it, is it 52 weeks out of the year? Well, no. They take a golden week off in May, which is a week. Then they'll take another uh, four or five weeks off in the summer. Then they'll take a week or two off in, in the fall. And then they'll take uh, probably about 10 days off during the, the winter and so on and so forth. So they're still pretty much getting out at the same time that we are. But they're not giving them those long eight, nine weeks that they're not attending any kind of formal academic training or any type of uh, going over what they learned the previous year. So it's pretty much ingrained in them. Uh, and having seen that, I, I know it can work because we do have it in, over in Pickens County. They're still doing their year, year round school uh, in one of the middle schools, and it seems to be working. And when I say it seems to be working, uh, the parents have embraced it, the, the students have embraced it. Uh, and then they move on to the high schools, and, and for as much as we know at this point, pretty much better prepared than the ones that don't. Uh, I'm like Eric, I'm not in favor of extending the school day, but I, I would like to see a year-round school concept. Okay, we'll send it back to Jeff Dishner. Let's make these so we can get in two more questions. One minute answers, one minute answers. Uh, so we'll start with Jeff. Um, how could the school district better use technology to make education more innovative and better engage students? Or perhaps you think that they do it well? It um, you know, technology is tough. Uh, it, it's going to be one of the biggest challenges because I know we've pretty much tripled or quadrupled the budget for technology over the last couple of years. And it, as soon as it comes out, it's already, it's already obsolete. Um, I, th I think it's a challenge. I think we're probably doing a good job of keeping up with it for now, but I think it's going to be an ongoing, uh, an ongoing process. So, uh, you know, if, if elected, I would be the kind of person that would push for continued uh, funding of technology to keep up with it because we're going to have to. We're going to have to have our kids ready for all the different technologies that are there. Again, just not the next generation of eye product, but the, the, really the next generation uh, of skills that they're going to need. 
Derek? Technology, how can it be better used to engage students, be more innovative in education? You know, I'm married to a school teacher who will tell me every day what's wrong with schools. Um, and one of the things that, that she really struggles with is the fact that when she graduated from college, um, she learned how to use Microsoft Office. And that was the extent of the, the training that was provided for her at school. Now she's in school and being expected to teach with technology that didn't exist when she was, when she was being taught how to use technology in the classroom. So we've really got to focus on professional development. We've got, we've got teachers who have smart boards who are literally using those smart boards as a coat rack. And when you ask them why they're using it that way, well, it's not, today's not the day we show movies. And so they, they don't know how to use this technology that's in their rooms. But next door, we've got teachers that are using smart boards to have students take virtual field trips of Europe. And I, I got to visit a, a French class where some students were taking a field trip while they were reading The Hunchback of Notre Dame. It was really amazing stuff. In the room next door, we had a teacher that had a sign above her blackboard that said, no personal devices, lock them away. And the students were doing research on the two desktop computers at the back of the room. So thank professional you. development is, is really the key to, to anything we've got. Thank you. Stephen, question about technology? Well, technology is a wonderful thing. And one thing I've noticed uh, around the state is that uh, districts are getting innovative with uh, engaging students, not only in the local school, but in schools that are 10, 15, 20 miles away. Uh, we talked earlier about uh, cyber, cyber uh, uh, security uh, down in Charleston. They're now teaching in one classroom, but they're, they're streaming it to two other classrooms. So they're, they're engaging more students using one teacher. Now, of course, they have to bring an aide in that sits in the classroom with the students that doesn't have a teacher. But that's one way to use that technology. If you go up to, to York County, they're using that technology to actually have their, their students go to York Technical College in industrial maintenance and it's being streamed into the classroom and then they have a set time that those students actually go over to the college and actually do the hands-on. So that's one way of using technology and technology is always evolving. As Murphy Law says, it's going to change over 18 months. Thank you, Lisa. Well, I agree with Derek. I think professional development for our teachers is important because unfortunately our kids are way ahead of where the teachers are. So they'll come in and teach the teacher how to do a Prezi or, or how to do the next, you know, use the next thing. My, my son started using Google Drive, said, here, here's my computer so you can use Word. I got it, I'm on Google Drive. So I think letting our students lead the way in technology and then holding our teachers accountable to keep up is what we need to do and then make sure we provide the professional development. I think the personal technology, we talk a lot about BYOD, bring your own device. And I think that's the way we've got to go because the student doesn't want to bring, doesn't want to use an iPad that belongs to us. They want to use their own device, whether it's the Galaxy or it's an iPhone or whatever it is. So working in that way and then leveraging it to personalize their learning. Thank you. We'll go back to Derek for this final question. Why should your voters in your district elect you to school board? Yeah, I've really had the opportunity to experience our schools all over the district, and I think that's really something that makes me unique from, from my opponents. We, we can focus on very specific schools in a very specific area, but, but we get a much better understanding of what our district needs when we understand that all of our schools are different, and that a student who's learning in a Title I school is having a very different learning experience than a student who's learning in Traveler's Rest or in Slater Mariana. And I think we really need to focus our energies on how we can better understand not only what all these schools' different learning experiences are like, but who in the community is willing to bring resources to the table if they're just asked. Um, you know, the work that we've done with the United Way and with the Chamber um, and with our funders has really helped me to, to better understand who is ready to come to the table if they're just asked. And I, and I, I believe that more than anyone, um, I have the ability to bring those, bring those partners to the table. Okay. Stephen? Well, the reason I think the, in District 28 should look at me as a candidate is, uh, first of all, what I bring to the table. I bring uh, 31 years of military experience, which also has the educational component with it. I'm a classroom teacher, I was a college professor, and now I work for the State Department of Education. Do I know it all? Well, no, I don't, but I do know how to ask the questions. And I tend to ask questions that tend to make people uneasy. And the reason I do that is because our children are the customers. And if we do not educate our children, then I don't know where we're going to end up. And I think Greenville is probably one of the best districts in the state. Does it have faults? Well, yes, it does. Does the school board make those faults? No. What the school board does is try to guide the administration. That's all they can do. And as your candidate, that's what I would like to do. Thank you.
Lisa? Um, I would say, uh, as District 28 can, uh, school board member for the last four years, I have done exactly those things that Mr. Watterson has talked about. Um, I'm an engineer, I'm not an educator, and I think bringing that aspect to the school board uh, has been an asset. Uh, I'm an advocate. I've talked to people in the parking lot, in the grocery store, at the open houses, on the football fields, and I've always stopped to listen, uh, hear their complaints, hear what their issues were, and then be an advocate, an active advocate, to help them work on those those things. I'm not focused on a single issue. I think one of the, the pitfalls of kind of having one thing that you're interested in is that our district is so large and so varied that you have to be able to look at the big picture and all the elements. So that's why I think I'm the right candidate and why I think people should reelect me to the school board. And microphone up back to Jeff Dishman. Thank you. Um, basically why I think I should be your school board representative is let's look at the, let's look at the uh, function of the school board. We talk about uh, philosophies of education. We talk about uh, a lot of fluffy things uh, of partnering with different agencies. But I, I really do think that the business of the school board is business. It's a $510 million plus business, okay? They deal with budgets, they deal with schedules, they deal with timelines, they deal with building and grounds. They deal with all the things that someone like me who has 25 years of business experience have dealt with for the last 25 years. Um, basically, I graduated from a Greenville, from a Jailman High School in 1984. In 1984, we said, thank God for Mississippi, and we're saying the same thing today. All, we don't need more education insiders. We need more people with plain spoken ideas who want to get things done. Thank you. I think it's appropriate for us to thank all the candidates for coming out tonight and answering all these questions.